Hi everyone, welcome to our November episode of our KML Foundation Table Talk vlog and podcast. I'm Paul Stamiski, your estate plan counselor, and you know, I always say I'm excited to bring these episodes to you because I believe they're informative and, and it can even be a little entertaining. Today's gonna to be a little bit different. It's gonna be very informative, but we're talking about something that quite honestly, you probably don't really wanna learn about, but it's very important. It's the topic of probate. My guest today is attorney Joanne Gromowski. She works with the probate process, she's familiar with it, and she's gonna give us some information on how this all works in, in some of the detail. Welcome, Joanne. Thank you, Paul, for having me here. You bet. Um, so I have to start just with the very first question. What actually happens when we start the probate process? Okay, so the first thing that you're gonna to wanna to do is look for the will has to be the original will and the last dated will. The second item that you're going to look for is called a codicil. You'll also want it to be the original one and the last dated one. Codicil is basically just an amendment to the will. It just changes a few items in the will so you didn't have to go ahead and get a whole new will. The third item that you're going to look for is an original and the last dated memorandum. And this is going to be just a list of everything that, of your personal items that you want to go to beneficiaries. So if you want the table to go to Aunt Molly and you want the chairs to go to Cousin Louie, it's going to have that list of all those personal items. Once you find those, then you're going to take them to court and you're going to submit them to the court. Um, there could be problems finding them because you don't know where they're located. They might be in a safe at home and there is no lock or combination to that lock or key. Um, there's also the problem when you put it in a safety deposit box. So in the safety deposit box, if you are the sole owner and you pass away and that's where your will is, your durable power of attorney for finance, that, that agent is not going to be able to get in because that document ends when you pass away. So they're going to have to go to court and get a court order to get that will. Um, so it's always a good idea to let the family and friends know, hey, this is where I keep all my important legal documents and how to get in there. And if it's a safety deposit box, make sure you have a joint owner on it. So, so there's some things that are really important to, to have right away at the beginning. First of all, if you have a will, make sure your loved ones know where it is and it's access accessible. And I didn't know that about the lockbox. Boy, if you've got your will, which you might think is a really important document, I'm going to put it in a safe place. But there's, there's some issues with that, too, that people might not be aware of. Yeah, if you own the lockbox by yourself individually and not as a joint owner with anyone else, no one else can get in that lockbox after you pass away. Not even your power of attorney agent can do that. You have to go to court, and then the court will issue an order to be able to get into that lockbox. Wow. So let's carry from there. So you, you, you find the documents. Um, Preferably, you get an attorney to help you, and then it gets to, submitted to the courts. Talk through now exactly what happens from there. Sure. From the court, you're going to petition the court and ask to be heard, and then the court is going to look at the will to make sure that it's valid under Wisconsin law or whatever state law that you're in, and they're going to make sure that there's no conflict of interest in there. They're also going to go ahead and appoint a personal representative. They're going to appoint a guardian for your child if they're minors or if they're disabled. And they're also going to appoint a trustee if needed. The trustee is the person that's going to manage the money for the minor children and then, until they become of age. After that, then the court is going to say, okay, everything's good. You can start calling the creditors, sending out notices to the creditors. Go ahead and um, issue notices to the beneficiaries, to the heirs. We call it to any interested party. After all those notices go out, the personal representative, that's when their job really starts because they're now going to have to collect all the assets, make an inventory, get appraisals of everything, pay out all of your debts, your final expenses. Um, if anyone owes you money, they're going to have to go ahead and collect that money. They might need to sell off real estate to pay off those bills. 
after all that stuff is done, all the litigation is done, that's when the beneficiaries finally get paid out. I'm hearing you say that it's got some detail to it, and, and I don't know how many of our viewers have a lot of experience going through probate. I believe when, when someone passes away, when a loved one passes away, you, you, you don't have a lot of history of practicing this. And so you rely on people like your pastor or your funeral director or an attorney to help you. And, I, and I'm hearing you say the attorney can be a great asset as you're going through this process. Consider the attorney a real partner and friend in this, not what maybe sometimes people think of an attorney as someone to avoid. Yes, the attorney is actually the one that's going to guide you through all this. It's not the judge's job. It's not the register of probate's job to do that. It's the attorney that does that. They're the ones that's familiar with all the laws. They're familiar with the time frame that it needs to be done in. They're familiar with all the different forms that need to be filed, the proper ones and at the proper time. So yes, the attorney becomes your best friend and guides you in all of that. Joanne, you explained a pretty detailed process. And I know every situation is unique, but just kind of on average, what kind of time frame are we talking about here? So each state has a different time frame. In Wisconsin, we have about 18 months that the judge would like it to be done. Some counties say we'd like it done in 12 months. The shorter time frame is six months. You're lucky if you do get it done in six months. Most of them are about 12 to 18 months, and it really depends on how complex the assets are, you know, how much litigation is going on, you know, did the house sell in time? So you can always ask for an extension. So some court cases go on for years, um, but we try to get them out between 12 and 18 months, but it doesn't happen. <laughs> and and I, can, I can verify that from my perspective too, that, that years is not out of the realm of possibility if it gets complicated. We talked about the process, you talked about the time, what's the cost? Well, the cost can vary. Right now, an estimate is anywhere from 3 to 8% of the total value of the assets that go to probate court. So if you look at just a house that's $150,000 and you're looking at the minimum amount is 3%, you're looking at about $4,500. But it can very much range. Um, some attorneys charge by the hour. Some attorneys charge flat fees. But if there's litigation, that cost can go skyrocketing. Um, there's also the court costs, the administration fees, the inventory fees. Um, if there's a bond needed, there's that fee. So lots of different fees that come in, so it can get very, very costly. Normally, I tell my clients, look at 8%. You know, if you're lucky if you get it less than that, but 8%, especially if it's going to be complicated and litigation. So that can be... That could be kind of pricey. I'm not sure people are always familiar with that aspect of it. The, it seems like the hassle of the process, but then there's also the cost that they have to plan for. Are there any other negatives that go along with probate? Lots of negatives besides time and cost. I mean, that's really the biggest ones that people are looking at. But just think about the stress that your family, they've lost you, your loved one, and now they have all these pressures coming at them. They don't know if they're going to be able to pay the bills. They don't know if they're going to have enough income coming in. And all those assets are locked up in probate court. That's the biggest problem is that time and the family going, Where, how do I pay these bills? What do I do next? Um, so I would say that's the biggest one. But then there's also, it is a public record. You know, most people don't realize that, you know, everything that happens in court, your neighbor can come down to the courthouse and say, well, I want to see what they had as far as debts. I want to know who was fighting over what. And that's all public record. They can get into that. You're, 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 you're telling us a lot of reality. And people might be a little intimidated, even angry about this. But I guess I'd rather have our viewers know this is the reality but also tell you there are some ways to maybe avoid some of this. But before we get into that, I know there are a lot of people because they just don't like attorneys and I'm gonna do whatever they can to avoid meeting with an attorney. It's gonna cost money, they're just money grubbers, they're gonna charge me every minute, whatever. So they're gonna figure this out on their own. They don't need a professional to write a will. I'll just, I'll write it on a piece of paper, I'll have it notarized and that will be good. And it isn't. 
So what happens then? Someone who thinks they have enough legal knowledge to do this according to the statutes, and they didn't. Well, they're only going to know that is if they have an attorney review it during their lifetime. If they never have an attorney review it, they're never going to know that they did it wrong. So then it's going to go to probate court, and it really is like having no will at all. Um, the family is going to go through so much more stress, and it's going to cost more time, and it's going to be a lot more money because the courts are going to have to figure it out, and the judge is going to be involved more. So it's like having no will at all. You know, you again mentioned something that I think is a much bigger topic here. I want to touch on something real quickly. You start talking 8% of an estate. We're talking literally thousands of dollars, maybe tens of thousands of dollars. And people are saying, I don't want to meet with an attorney and, and take the time and money to write a will, write an estate plan. Not realizing the, the relatively small amount of money they spend in meeting with you at beginning will save a lot of money in the end. And so I encourage you, don't have that attitude. Don't be afraid of meeting with an attorney to create a good estate plan at the beginning. It's going to be much easier in the long run and, and far less expensive. So back to what you said as far as not having a, what you think is a legal will but it isn't, is really like having no will at all. You know, Joanne, this sounds like a whole nother issue here because I'm sure a lot of people, I know nationwide statistics indicate there might be two-thirds of Americans that don't have an active current will. So this is a need. Maybe we should have you come back for another episode to talk a little bit more about what happens in that situation. Would you be willing to do that? Oh, yes, definitely. Oh, thank, thank you, Joanne. I, I, I appreciate it. And, and I just think, again, this is, this is valuable information. You, you maybe don't like what the reality is, but it is a reality. But I, but I also can tell you there are certain ways that we can maybe avoid some of those time, cost, frustration issues just by good planning at the beginning. Is there anything you want to add, Joanne? I would say definitely seek out an attorney, whichever attorney, get some legal advice because having a will and having your estate plan set up properly is probably the last gift that you're going to give to your family. And I think you'd want to leave them with that, hey, mom and dad, they made sure everything was taken care of so I didn't have this frustration, I didn't have the stress, rather than I can't believe they didn't do anything and now this is what I got to go through. It's that lasting impression. It's the last gift that you can give to them. Well said, Joanne. Thanks, thanks for being my guest today. Uh, and again, uh, thanks for sharing this valuable information. I really want to thank Joanne for the information she shared today. You know, she said something at the end I think that is really important. Having a good estate plan is maybe the last special gift that you give to your loved ones. You know, I, on the converse, I've seen too many people that say, you know, I'm not going to do this. I'll just let my kids figure it out. They're, they're good kids. They'll figure it out. I don't think they're going to argue. They'll, they'll, they'll get along fine. It'll be great. And, and I just think that that's not the right approach to take. I think when you hear what the process is, if we can make that easier in some way, um, I, I think it's, it truly is a loving gift that you can give to your family. You know, we often say, this is your life, it's your plan, and it's your legacy. And clearly, this is a great way to leave a positive legacy to your loved ones. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you again next month.